This session will be recorded, um, and again, this is Sean Barbeau with the Center for, Transit, Center for Urban Transportation Research, and I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Candace Brakewood. Uh, Dr. Brakewood recently completed her PhD in civil engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology, and she'll be joining the faculty of City College of New York in the fall. The overarching goal of her research is to improve public transportation systems using new technologies, particularly information and communication technologies. Previously, Candace worked as a patent examiner at the U.S. United States Patent and Trademark Office in Alexandria, Virginia. She has a dual Master of Science degrees in Transportation and Technology Policy from MIT and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engin Engineering from John Hopkins University. Uh, Candace will answer any questions that you have at the end of her presentation, and she's also going to take a few questions after the first portion of her talk on her research in Tampa, Florida. So, Candace, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Sean. Um, can you just let me know if you can hear me okay, Sean? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Excellent. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and begin the presentation on evaluating the impacts of real-time transit information in Tampa and Atlanta. And I should note that this was part of my dissertation research at Georgia Tech in Atlanta, where I worked with Professor Carrie Watkins. To give you a brief outline of my presentation, I'll motivate it, talk about the overarching research approach, provide the results of two studies, one in Tampa, the other in Atlanta, and I'll pause briefly after the Tampa study for some short questions, and then I'll, at the end, have comparison and conclusion. Diving right into the motivation. As I'm sure you, many of you are well aware, um, there are many benefits of providing public transportation services in urban areas. It can help to combat congestion. It has positive energy and environmental benefits. It also um, is, has positive benefits in terms of safety, such as low passenger fatality rates compared to automobile travel. It provides equitable mobility options for those who cannot or do not want to drive, among other benefits. Despite the benefits of public transportation, um, in the US, there's actually a relatively small number of people who commute on transit. What you're looking at is the American Community Survey. The rightmost column shows the 2009 statistics for the means of transportation to work for commuters age 16 and over. The vast majority of people in the US commute on private automobiles, with only about 5% commuting via public transportation. In the two urban areas that this research has focused, we see um, similar levels to the nationwide statistics, about 5% transit commuting in the Atlanta area, and in the Tampa Bay region, a little bit less than that. Um, so if we want to encourage public transportation, uh, there are many uh, challenges and issues with uh, the current service in many urban areas. I'm just focusing on one for this research, and that is the reliability of service. And when I talk about reliability, I'm referring to providing service on time. So that's the buses or the trains arriving as scheduled. To give you an example, um, here is MARTA's bus on time performance. Uh, this is system-wide from uh, January 2013 until the end of 2013. The transit agency defines on time as being up to five minutes late. As you can see, approximately 75 to 78% of trips in the Atlanta region arrive on time. That means there are nearly a quarter of trips that are more than five minutes late. Thinking about that, that means there's quite a few bus riders um, standing on the street corner waiting for buses that are arriving more than five minutes late. And there are many strategies um, that transit agencies take to improve reliability. Many of these are supply side approaches, um, such as increasing the level of dedicated right of way. So instead of having a bus operating in mixed traffic, uh, it can have, for example, a dedicated bus lane. Similarly, there's service planning strategies, such as, for example, adding slack to scheduled running times. While many of these supply-side strategies um, are very effective at improving levels of reliability, they're often relatively expensive for transit agencies and other planning agencies to implement. Recently, um, another approach, a demand-side approach, um, that has emerged to address reliability is to provide riders with real-time transit information. And when I say real-time information, 
I'm referring to um, the location or predicted arrival time of the vehicle, so the bus or the train, such as what you see on the right side of the screen. That's a screenshot of the One Bus Away real-time transit information apps. The rightmost column shows the number of minutes until the vehicle will arrive at that particular stop. stop. While um, this strategy does not actually improve the reliability of service, it helps riders to adjust their behavior in the event that a vehicle is running behind schedule. So it can help to improve the perception of reliability. Moreover, there are other benefits to passengers of providing real-time vehicle location and arrival information. I've broadly categorized the literature on this into three key benefits to riders. The first is decreased wait times. Second, increased satisfaction with transit service. And the third is increased level of transit travel. I've also highlighted um, some seminal studies in these areas. So on the left side, you'll see decreased wait times, a study that was done by Dr. Kerry Watkins at Georgia Tech, um, who is my advisor, and colleagues in the Seattle region, in which they looked at the actual waiting times of passengers and their perceived wait times, compared those who are using mobile real-time information, so mainly provided through smartphone apps, to those who are not. And they found that there was a decrease in both the perceived and actual wait times of real-time information users. So if passengers are spending less time waiting, which is notoriously one of the most disliked elements of a transit trip, it follows that they may be more satisfied with overall transit service. One study done on the University of Maryland campus by Zhang et al. found an increase in overall satisfaction with the shuttle bus service because of providing real-time bus information. So if people spend less time waiting, they're more satisfied with the service, it follows that they may travel on transit more frequently. And a study recently conducted in the Chicago area found um, at the aggregate level an increase in route level ridership attributable to real-time bus information of approximately 1% to 2% of route level ridership. So for my research, um, I will be focusing on all three of these for the Tampa study, trying to provide a comprehensive overview of the benefits to passengers um, of using real-time information. And in the second study, Atlanta, I'm focused primarily on the third benefit, increasing transit travel or ridership. But I'm looking at a disaggregate level, so individual travelers and their behavior. So continuing on um, to my research approach. I'm focused on studying a real-time information system known as One Bus Away. This is an open source system that was originally developed at the University of Washington in Seattle by Brian Ferris and Carrie Watkins over five years ago. The, because the system is open source, the MTA in New York City has taken the code base, adapted it, rebranded it as Bus Time, and launched it throughout the New York City region. That's what you see on the bottom right hand of the screen, the MTA Bus Time interface. I should note that the third study in my dissertation was on New York City, um, and the results for this should be available in a few months. What I'm focused on today are the two latest deployments of One Bus Away, Tampa, Florida, and Atlanta. They use the interface that you see on the top right-hand side of the screen, which is similar to Seattle, Washington. There are also a few uh, other cities that have beta versions of One Bus Away right now. While well, my research is focused on Wombus Way, I'm not just evaluating that single suite of real-time information apps. Because open data accompanies Wombus Way, third-party software developers or the transit agency can develop other apps using the open data, the real-time vehicle tracking location, and launch them as well. So I'm looking at any real-time information that has been launched in Tampa and Atlanta. For more information on the Wombus Way system, um, check out wombusaway.org. In comparing uh, the two cities, you'll notice uh, that Tampa has a smaller bus system, which is operated by HART, and Atlanta has both um, a bus system as well as a rail system. The key um, characteristics that determine the research approach that I've used in these two cities is first, how real-time information was deployed to riders, and second, what data sources were available. So these two characteristics really de determine the methodology that I've used to then evaluate the rider behavior and the benefits of real-time information. In Tampa, um, the real-time information first became available in the spring of 2013 in a small pilot program. 
And that small scale pilot is the focus of my study. Later that year, real time information was deployed system wide. The primary data source for that is web based surveys of transit riders conducted before and after real time information became available. So the methodology is a before after control group design, which draws heavily from the social sciences literature. In Atlanta, real time information has gradually become available in many different ways over the last year. In the spring of 2013, One Bus Away was launched in a beta form. MARTA has developed their own apps in house and launched them in the fall of 2013. Um, and other apps, apps have become available over the past year thanks to MARTA's open data. Additionally, Atlanta has a unique case in which they have a smart card system, a smart card ticketing system in which passengers can pay their fares by tapping the plastic card on bus fare boxes or at the gates and rail stations. These plastic smart cards provide a unique data source which tracks the transit travel of individual riders over an extended period of time. So I'm using that data to understand the travel, the number of trips made by riders in a disaggregate analysis. So diving right into the first uh, study results in Tampa, Florida. And I should note that this was done in collaboration with Dr. Sean Barbeau, the moderator, who is the technical lead on launching the One Bus Away platform in Tampa, as well as my advisor, Dr. Carrie Watkins. So as I mentioned before, in Tampa, I conducted a before after control group uh, experiment. And the motivation for this was that HART, the trans agency, provided us with special access to the real time bus tracking data. All of the bus fleet was already equipped with automatic vehicle location, AVL equipment, and they were, the trans agency was using the data in-house for operations purposes. They provided us the data to develop uh, the One Bus Away system. And we recruited um, transit riders through the transit agency website and their email list to participate in the small scale study and pilot launch of One Bus Away. Before we began the study, we asked all participants to fill out a web-based survey which included questions about their travel behavior, et cetera. Then we divided the group in half using a random number generator, and half became the control group without access to real-time information. The other half was the experimental group who had access to five different interfaces of one bus away, three websites, one regular website, two mobile websites, and two native smartphone applications, both an iPhone and an Android application. They had access to the One Bus Away system for approximately a three-month study period. And at the end, we conducted additional web-based surveys about their travel behavior. I should note that one of the biggest challenges to conducting this um, experiment was to limit the use of real-time information only to our experimental group. How we did this for both the iPhone and Android apps is what you see on the right-hand side of the screen. Passage, or the riders were instructed to download the applications, the One Bus Away applications from the Seattle area. They had to make a small setting change, which is what you see on the rightmost screenshot. That is what kept our control group to actually not have access to real-time information and only our user group to have access to it. A key assumption in comparing the experimental and control groups is that they're actually equivalent. So at the end of the study period, uh, we compared for the final approximately 200 people in the study, their age, household income, car ownership levels, having a license, gender, and employment status, and found that they're statistically not different. The only difference between the two groups at the end of the study was a small difference in ethnicity. We had more Hispanics in our experimental group and more Caucasians in the control group. Diving right into the findings. Thinking back to the chart of the benefits from the literature review, there were three key areas. The first was decreased wait times. So how we measured this in the Tampa study was asking the survey respondents to self-report their usual wait time on the route that they ride most frequently on the before survey and on the after survey. As you can see in the chart, both the control group and the experimental group waited on average about 11 minutes on the before survey. On the after survey, the experimental group decreased. And when we calculate the difference from the before to the after survey for each individual respondent, we found that the experimental group's usual wait time decreased approximately 1.79 minutes. That's nearly a minute and a half more than the control group. And this difference was statistically significant. 
leading us to conclude that the real -time, use of real-time information is associated with a decrease in self-reported usual wait time. Moreover, we wanted to understand if the real-time information users were perceiving this to be a benefit. So at the very end of the post-wave survey, we asked, has using one bus away changed the amount of time you wait at the bus stop? And again, this was only for real-time information users. And we found that approximately two-thirds of them said that they spend somewhat less or much less time waiting at the stop. So they're perceiving this to be a change. Additionally, we wanted to explore something that we had heard anecdotally, um, and that is while waiting for the bus, um, passengers can become quite frustrated or anxious um, while they're waiting for their vehicle to arrive. So we asked on the before and the after survey, for both groups to rate on a five-point Likert scale how often they feel um, these various feelings. As you can see, levels of frustration decreased significantly while waiting for the bus for the group that was using real-time information over the study period. Similarly, we wanted to understand um, changes in their perception of different feelings while waiting for the bus. And one interesting one was feelings of relaxation while waiting. Nearly two-thirds of One Bus Away users agreed that they feel more relaxed while waiting for the bus since they started using real-time information. So thinking back to the literature review again, the second key benefit from the literature of real-time information is satisfaction. Um, so on the before and the after surveys, we asked participants to rate on a five-point Likert scale various indicators pertaining to the satisfaction with uh, aspects of the transit agency service, as well as overall bus service. As you can see, two of the indicators had significant increases in satisfaction levels. The first was how long you have to wait for the bus, and the second was how often the bus arrives at the stop on time, which was our proxy for reliability of service. This aligns very nicely with the previous analysis of usual wait times. I should note that the overall heart bus service indicator did not change, which is at the bottom of the chart. However, when we asked about uh, the real-time information group's perception, they said since they began using One Bus Away, many of them actually feel more satisfied with overall service. In fact, over two-thirds of them. Last, we wanted to understand if the participants in the study were traveling more frequently on the heart bus service. So in the before and the after survey, we asked each participant to report the number of bus trips that they had made in the last week. So this is a very simple measure of transit travel. As you can see in the before survey, both groups made approximately seven bus trips in the last week. However, in the after survey, both groups actually experienced a small decrease in the number of transit trips. This difference was not statistically significant between the two groups leading us to conclude that, based on this very simple measure of transit travel, the study participants did not change their behavior because of real-time information. However, again, at the end of the survey, just for the real-time information user group, we asked, has using one bus away changed the number of heart bus trips that you take? And almost 39% said that they ride somewhat or much more often. I'll talk about reasons for this in just a second. So what did we conclude? First, we found significant improvements in the waiting experience. This includes decreases in self-reported usual wait times experienced by real-time information users, decreases in negative feelings such as frustration, increases in satisfaction with wait times and reliability of service. However, we found little evidence supporting a change in the number of transit trips. Despite this, approximately one-third of the real-time information users stated that they ride the bus more frequently. This could have been because of an affirmation bias, which is something that's common in the survey literature. Respondents of surveys often respond in a positive manner, either to make their participation or the study itself look more favorable. It could have also been due to the insufficient scale of measurement of the number of trips on the park bus system. We only looked at one week before and one week after. This is something that we've improved in the Atlanta study. Last, I should note that only riders within the sphere of the transit agency were recruited to participate in the study. We recruited primarily through the transit agency website and their email list, and therefore we did not have a good means of reaching potentially completely new riders for this study. And last, um, the key contribution here 
was using a social science methodology, this before-after control group behavioral experiment to evaluate smartphone applications. So with that, um, I can take a brief pause if there's any uh, questions uh, about the Tampa study. All right. Um, so Candace, um, there's a question. You mentioned that participants for the Tampa study were recruited primarily from the transit agency website. Were they representative of all heart bus riders? Oh, that's a very good question, Sean. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, so they were not representative of all heart bus riders. Um, we actually compared the demographics uh, from our study to the last uh, system-wide ridership survey conducted in 2009, and there were three key differences. We had higher income levels, higher levels of automobile ownership, and more white participants as opposed to African Americans. Um, despite this, though, our population was actually still primarily transit dependent. For example, 52% um, of the people in the study did not have a car in their household. Okay, great. And um, just to remind everyone, if you uh, need one to ask a question, you can use the Q&A um, button that's up in the upper left-hand corner and to type your question into the box. Um, we had another question here. Um, did the scheduled headway of the user's given route affect perceptions? Um, that's a really good question. So we made sure to ask which route the transit riders or the, the respondent used predominantly in the before survey and then as well in the after survey. So we were able to see which participant changed their usual route, the one that they ride most frequently, and that did not have an effect on a, the number of different indicators that we looked at. I was particularly concerned with that potential effect on the wait time analysis, um, and when I reran the statistics controlling for that, it did not have an impact. Okay, great. Um, another question, um, what would you do differently for the Tampa study knowing what you know now? A great question. Um, so one of the key things was, the, as I mentioned, the trips per week. I only looked at one week before and one week after. I definitely need to have a longer period of time to look at changes in behavior. They're probably not going to occur, you know, instantaneously, and we need a more reliable measure um, to understand the number of trips on transit. The other thing would be trying to get more participants in the study. Our final sample size was approximately 220 people divided evenly between both groups. So having a larger sample size would have helped um, increase the robustness of the results. All right, and we'll take one more question now, and then we'll address any additional questions at the end of the presentation. So the question is, um, the, uh, they were wondering if uh, real-time information mainly attracted new riders or if it was existing riders that were impacted. Right. So that's, as I mentioned before, um, how we recruited participants was primarily through the transit agency website and through the transit agency's email list. So we were really focusing on participants who were existing riders, at least in a small capacity. So we really didn't look at completely new riders, and I, I think that's an excellent area for future research. Okay, great. I guess, uh, Candice, if you want to continue, uh, and we will address any other questions at the end. Great. Thank you. Um, so continuing on with the second study of Atlanta, Georgia, which I did um, under the with uh, Professor Kerry Watkins at Georgia Tech. So as some background on the real-time information, the availability of real-time information in Atlanta, um, there was, have been a number of different apps that have launched over the past year or so. Marta's uh, on-the-go apps, which is what you see on the right hand of the screen, those are iPhone and Android apps, launched in the fall of 2013. The One Bus Away system was publicly launched in February 2014, and a number of other apps have also become available over the last year or so. Because of the gradual increase in the availability of real-time information in the Atlanta area, I chose a before-after um, analysis of MARTA trips. So I'm looking at April 2013, comparing it to April 2014. That's a month before the main launch of real-time information in Atlanta, and a month after most of the apps had already been launched. Again, I'm looking at disaggregate traveler behavior. My unit of analysis is the individual rider. And the primary data source for this analysis is the Breeze Card ticketing system. So the smart cards that transit riders use to pay by tapping whenever they make a trip on the bus fare box or at the gates in the rail stations. So I can accurately measure the number of trips made on bus or trains operated by MARTA 
going back over time using this database of smart card numbers or smart card trips. Um, since I'm not sure, uh, I'm assuming that many people on the webinar have not worked with smart card data before. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what it actually looks like. So this is a single um, transit card transaction history. This is actually the transactions from Dr. Carrie Watkins' trips. These are her trips uh, in 2013. And as you can see, um, the database includes the day uh, and the time of each trip. This is necessary for doing the before-after analysis. We know which trips were made in 2013 and which in 2014. It also includes the mode, if it's MARTA bus or MARTA rail, as well as um, which stations a person someone tapped in at. So that could be Lindbergh Center or Lenox, as you see on this history, as well as the route from the bus, such as the Route 36. I should note that the data that MARTA provided us did not include the station or the route for each traveler. They aggregated it to the number of trips on the bus system or on the rail system for each day. That was to ensure the privacy of all study participants. So I have this very rich smart card trip history. The tricky question is figuring out who's actually using real-time information. So to do this, we conducted a web-based survey during the first week of May. And the key question on the survey was, do you use real-time information? And we presented participants with a screenshots of common apps that, like you see on the right, such as MARTA's apps, One Bus Away apps, and other apps. Then we made sure to recruit both real-time information users and non-users based on that question. Additionally, the survey contained a question, as you see on the bottom of the screen, what is your 16-digit Breeze card number? That is a unique serial number on the back of the card, which allowed us to match the survey responses to the Breeze card data. In the survey, a total of 669 participants initially entered the software, of which 538 provided a unique 16-digit smart card number. 494 of those matched active, usable smart cards. We were then able to take the smart card trip history, which MARTA provided, and then merge it with the survey responses using the unique smart card ID number. That combined smart card survey data set is the basis for this analysis. As I said before, we had 494 initial participants. However, we wanted to make sure that the smart card data is accurately representing an individual's travel behavior. So to do this, I imposed a series of conditions on the data set. The first condition is what I call panel eligibility. I wanted to ensure that I could do the before-after analysis of April 2013 and April 2014. So in the survey, we asked participants who use real-time information to recall approximately when they started using an app with real-time information. Basically, I wanted to make sure that people who started using real-time information in April 2014 or as late as May 2014 were not included in the analysis so that the full month they had exposure to real-time information. Similarly, in the survey, I asked participants to recall when they started using their Breeze Card Smart Card um, to make sure that they've been using the same card for at least a year, going back to April 2013. Many participants had recently gotten their Smart Card and therefore were not eligible for the before-after analysis. So I excluded those participants, and the sample size reduced to 305 eligible participants. Next, I impose a condition that I call complete and unique. Basically, I'm trying to assume that one card, one smart card, is equivalent to one person. So on the survey, participants were asked if they have one Breeze card or two or three Breeze cards. As you can see, um, the sample size reduced again for those who only have one Breeze card. That means that their Breeze card history would be complete. Their trips are not on another card. Similarly, we asked survey participants if they use other fare media. Occasionally, people pay with cash upon boarding buses, or a small number of people use the paper Breeze ticket. Those participants were also excluded um, because, again, their Breeze card trip history would not have included all of their trips. Last, on the survey, participants were asked if they share their Breeze card with other people. If they shared their card, then the history would not be unique. It would represent more than one person's traveler behavior, and so we excluded those folks as well, reducing the sample size down to 159 eligible participants. 
Finally, I impose the condition that I call congruence. This assumption is that that card actually corresponds to that person's stated travel behavior. I assess this condition by asking each survey respondent to report the number of MARTA train trips that they made in the last week. The survey software had a date and time stamp for each response, so I could compare the exact seven days to the seven days from the corresponding smart card trip history. If a person's response was within two train trips over the last week, I called them closely congruent. The reason for allowing for plus or minus two trips was because many survey respondents are often subject to what we call recall bias, in which they have difficulty recalling the number of trips that they made over the last week. Last, I assessed perfect congruence. Those were people who reported the exact same number of MARTA train trips in the survey that corresponded to the smart card trip history. After imposing all of these conditions, only 100 of the initial 494 participants met all three conditions of panel eligibility, complete, unique, and congruence. This significantly decreased our sample size, but for this small sample size, that's the focus of the analysis of real-time information. So next, um, I conducted the before-after comparison of MARTA trips using the smart card trip history. In the left column, you see the results for all of the participants, that's all 494 people, regardless of meeting the conditions. On the right, you see the closely and perfectly congruent con participants. Again, small sample sizes of only 135 and 100, respectively. So first, I looked at their smart card trip history for the number of trips that they made in April 2013. Before real-time information was launched, on average, real-time information users were making approximately 10 trips per month on MARTA buses and trains. This is more than the non-user group, which led us to conclude that those who ride more frequently were more likely to adopt real-time information during the study period. Then I looked at the difference for each individual traveler between April 2013 and April 2014. And as you can see, the difference for real-time information users was greater than non-users. For the entire sample size, this was a statistically significant difference. However, as I said before, this was before we imposed the conditions on the data set. So to draw the conclusions, I focused on the closely congruent and perfectly congruent participants. Again, the difference in trips from April 2014 to April 2013 is greater for real-time information users. However, this difference is not statistically significant, which led me to conclude that for this small sample size, real-time information did not have a significant increase on transit trips. Additionally, on this survey, we asked a series of questions about participants' changes over the last year. For example, we asked, have you increased the number of cars in your household or decreased the number of cars in your household? Have you moved household locations or job locations? These retrospective questions, which could have caused an increase or decrease in passengers' travel on transit, were then included in a regression analysis with other standard socioeconomic and travel behavior questions, such as do you have a license, et cetera. Those questions were then used in a regression analysis, looking at the difference in trips from April 2013 to April 2014. Again, it's that same difference in trips from the last slide. That was a dependent variable. So from this, looking at the real-time information, the use of real-time information, when we look at the full sample, the nearly 500 participants, all the data, real-time information did have a positive, significant effect. However, again, when we look at the closely congruent or perfectly congruent smart card trip histories, real-time information was not significant. So even though we've now controlled for many other things that could have affected passengers' travel behavior, we still did not see a, a significant change in trips from the real-time information user group. Last, at the end of the survey, we asked real-time information users about perceived changes, very similar to what we did in Tampa. And what you're looking at here is the response to questions about riding just the train system. We also asked similar ones for the bus system. For the perfectly congruent group, you'll notice that 76% of them said that using an app with real-time information has not changed the number of trips that they typically take on MARTA trains. So it aligns nicely with the previous analysis. However, 
When we asked, has using an app with real-time information changed the amount of time you spend waiting for MARTA trains, a large percentage of respondents said that they spend somewhat or much less time waiting. Similarly, when we asked, has real-time information changed how satisfied you are with MARTA train service, over 50% said that they feel somewhat or much more satisfied with MARTA trains. So in summary, for the Atlanta study, um, for the full data set, we did see real-time information users increasing their transit trips. However, imposing the conditions on the data set is more likely to represent accurate transit travel. And so from that, we concluded that there was not a significant difference between real-time information users and non-users from the smart card trip history. Despite this, we did find that many real-time information users had perceived benefits from using real-time information, including decreased wait times and increased satisfaction with MARTA service. And I should emphasize the key limitation of this study was the decreasing sample size as I imposed the conditions, beginning with nearly 500 participants and decreasing to only 20% of that initial sample size for the final conclusions. And the method of combining smart card and survey data to conduct a sort of before-after analysis is a key contribution that other trans agencies could use um, and replicate in other surveys that they're doing. So briefly, um, comparisons and conclusion. In Tampa, we conducted a before-after before control group uh, behavioral experiment. From this, we found little evidence supporting a change in bus trips. However, we only looked at one week before and one week after of transit travel. We did find significant improvements in the waiting experience, particularly self-reported usual wait times. In MARTA, we conducted a before-after analysis of transit trips using smart card data to look at one month a year ago compared with one month this year. Based on that, I found little evidence, again, supporting a change in bus or train trips associated with real-time information use. However, there were improvements um, in the perception with wait times and overall satisfaction with MARTA. So going back to that initial literature review, I found evidence supporting um, decreased wait times in both studies, as well as increased satisfaction um, of different elements of transit or overall satisfaction, again, in both studies. But from these two disaggregate studies, did not find a significant change in transit travel. I should note, though, that I've been working on a third study as part of my dissertation, which did find a positive increase in New York City. So check back with me in about a month um, if you're interested in the results of this study. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions, and feel free to email me at cbreakwood at gmail.com with additional questions or comments. Great. Well, thank you very much, Candice. Um, I believe that uh, we will take uh, questions again at this point. Um, and just to review how to submit questions, once again, you can click on the Q&A button at the top left-hand corner of your screen, uh, type your question or comment into the box, and then click the Ask button to submit your questions. Um, and answered questions uh, will appear in the bottom of the box, um, and the presenters can also uh, chat directly with the, um, the attendees. Um, so I'll go straight to a question here. Would it appear that the mode choice behavior of the more casual riders relative to regular riders is more heavily impacted by the availability of real-time information? Um, Yes, if I understand the question correctly, um, particularly in the Atlanta study, we found that those who were um, riding more frequently were more likely to use real-time information. Um, we did not have a large enough sample size to um, further segment it between um, riders for the additional analysis, though. So that's something I would like to look at more in future studies if we can get um, more participants in the studies. Okay, and um, another question. How often is uh, location data updated in the application? Sean, can you answer that for the Tampa study? <laughs> um, yeah, so I can answer that for the Tampa study. Um, it was roughly every 60 seconds per vehicle or when the vehicle hits a time point. Um, and then there's probably a, about 15 seconds at the most of the uh, delay until that uh, information reach, reaches the user. So in a worst case scenario, a little over a minute between when the position is calculated on the bus and, and the rider sees it. And Atlanta, that I, I don't know. Um, I think it's uh, actually a little bit longer in Atlanta, although um, I don't have the exact numbers offhand. 
Okay, and uh, another question here. If any of the apps you examine provide data for more than one system or region, how easy was it to get the data for just the system of interest? Uh, we use Transloc and cannot get the data for just our, re our region, to my knowledge. So we didn't actually look at the, the data coming from the apps. I mean, they were used to create the apps. I'm, I'm not totally sure I understand the question. Yeah, I, I think that's, um, that is the question. Is, is, was data gathered from the app? Um, did you use that in your um, study? Okay, sure. So we didn't do an evaluation of the actual, for example, on-time performance based on the real-time vehicle locations. We did not actually look at that. And we should also probably say that this was prior to One Bus Away being a fully multi-region application in the Tampa instance. Um, all right, so uh, another question here. Um, you showed the difference in MARTA trips for riders. Did you look at the differences between bus and train trips? Yes, actually, that's something we did. Um, the statistics I presented uh, on the in this presentation were aggregated both bus and train together, um, but we broke them down further to look at changes just in bus trips and changes in train trips, and the results were very similar to what you've seen. Um, no statistically significant change for those two groups with the congruence um, conditions. Okay. Um, uh, you had mentioned that uh, the survey methodology for Atlanta using the smart card data could be used uh, by other transit agencies in their surveys. Could you elaborate on that? Sure. So um, the key question that we included in the survey questionnaire was to ask for each respondent's 16-digit smart card number. Um, this has actually been used by a couple of other transit agencies recently. I believe Transport for London and the MBTA in Boston have been asking for this number on their standard travel surveys. Um, to expand upon that analysis and do, such as I did, a before, after, or a panel analysis, um, asking a few questions about the fare media, so do you share your card, do you use other forms of payment, as well as asking recall questions about, you know, moving or that sort of thing over the last year, um, could be easily replicable in other travel surveys. Okay, and another question. Uh, did you uh, do any observations or record any data related to weather events uh, during these studies? Uh, we commonly have snowstorms and our on-time performance decreases significantly. That is a very good question. Um, in Tampa, um, as best as I recall, there were no major incidents over our three-month study period. Um, at one point, I believe I went back and checked um, the weather uh, conditions, so that uh, was not a significant factor. Um, and then in Atlanta, I specifically chose April 2013 and April 2014, those two months, because in the interim, there were things such as major weather, weather incidents occurring, for example, in February of 2014. So I was um, very careful to choose uh, the period of analysis to ex try to exclude things like that. Okay, and um, another question. Um, you showed the difference in bus trips per week for the, for the Tampa study. You showed the bus uh, difference in bus trips per week from the before period to the after period and found there was no significant difference uh, in the change between the two groups. Do you think uh, things other than real-time uh, real information could have affected, um, for example, what if the people in the real-time information group purchased a car during the study period? Yes, that's a, that's a very good question. So um, actually, similar to the Atlanta study, we did ask a series of retrospective questions in the Tampa um, survey questionnaire for the post-wave survey, including did you change household locations, did you change job locations, did you purchase a car? So it's very similar questions from the Atlanta study. Um, and I used those in a similar regression analysis um, in Tampa. But the results were actually very, very similar to the simple T statistics that I presented. Um, so we base our conclusions um, uh, that those did not have a significant effect um, on the number of trips. Okay. Um, uh, so for the Atlanta study, um, which was uh, done after the Tampa study, I guess you had learned some things from the Tampa study. What did you learn from the Atlanta study that you would um, look at doing differently in future research? Um, as I mentioned um, in the conclusions, the key limitation of that study 
was um, the decreasing sample size. So I started with approximately 500 participants in the study, which is a nice, um, robust sample size. But then once I asked the questions about sharing smart cards, paying with other forms of fair media, my sample size decreased significantly. So that's something that I think will vary from city to city if someone else were to replicate this methodology in another um, transit system with smart cards. Um, but keeping in mind the fair policies and how much of an impact that may have on these sorts of uh, questions, such as sharing cards, et cetera, um, would be something I would try to improve on in the future. Okay. And uh, what are other potential areas of future research um, that would follow these studies? Um, sure. So I think there's uh, many different areas coming out of this. Um, as I mentioned, I'm focusing on ridership impact in another study I'm working on in New York City. Um, but future research could look at impacts of things such as different levels of reliability, um, differences in frequency of service, et cetera, um, and in collaboration with the provision of real-time vehicle location information and see if there are, for example, differences in passenger wait times or um, trips in varying levels of service. I think also, you know, there's all sorts of smartphone apps coming out now providing different types of new and emerging transit and other mode informations and not just real-time vehicle location information, but looking at things like real-time crowding levels um, and other attributes of the system is going to be something um, very interesting for future research as those sorts of apps come out. Okay. Um, uh, are your findings for your dissertation available um, somewhere online where people can, can view them? Um, sure. So actually, you have to email me to get them. They are currently not um, available through the Georgia, Georgia Tech libraries. So if you send me an email at cbreakwood at gmail.com, I'll happily send you the dissertation. Okay. And next question. Uh, what would you say to someone who says, real -time, if real-time information doesn't increase ridership, why should we invest in it? So I think that the benefits we're seeing in terms of reducing wait times and increasing satisfaction are really important. Um, you know, typically when we're doing various sorts of uh, project evaluation, we're quantifying people's changes in travel time. So a reduction in wait time or the reduction in perceived wait time could then be quantified and included as a benefit in for example, a cost-benefit analysis. So I think that there are these benefits are significant, um, and I would encourage transit agencies to continue um, investing in and providing real-time information. Okay. Um, another question: Do you think the use of of surveys affected um, how uh, the answers that people gave versus some other techniques to to gather information from uh, participants? That is an excellent question. Um, so the way that we designed the, the surveys um, was specifically to have their self-reported travel behavior questions coming first. So asking people, how many trips did you make on the bus system? How many? How long is your wait time? Before asking any questions specifically about real-time information, because we wanted to try to avoid biasing them as much as possible, um, particularly in the Tampa instance. Um, so, but despite that people did know that we were trying to evaluate real-time information. So I think that to some extent it did bias um, their responses, particularly those perceived benefits. Um, it could have had an impact on that. Okay, great. Um, so we uh, are showing now the evaluation uh, screen on the um, webcast. So if you would please take a few uh, seconds to fill this out uh, and tell us uh, what you thought. and. Um, anything that you'd like to do in the future. Um, we, uh, I know that there is an FTA webinar starting at uh, 1 o'clock uh, that is focusing on open data. And uh, as Candace mentioned in her presentation, open data enables applications like One Bus Away and, and others uh, to, for transit riders. So um, if you're interested, we definitely encourage you to check out on the FTA website um, and or uh, Google FTA or webinar open data data policy guidelines for transit, um, and you'll be able to register for that webinar coming up at 1. Um, while we are uh, filling out the evaluation, I will ask one more question here. Um, have you considered doing a study in San Francisco where there is huge real-time usage, over 200,000 users per day, and fare card information? Um, 
No, I actually have not, but I do know of one that was recently done in San Francisco um, by Andre Carell at UC Berkeley. Um, he looked at muni passengers and how um, they adapt to the unreliability of service if a bus is late, et cetera. So um, I can send whoever asked the question um, a link to that study, um, which is a very, very good study, and I'd encourage you, um, if you're in San Francisco, um, to, to look it up. Okay, and with that, I think we will wrap up today's webinar. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and thank you, Candace, for presenting, and uh, we hope to see you next time. Thank you.